So hello everyone uh, back from the break. Uh, Christine, our next speaker, is already uh, online and I see her on the screen. Um, so welcome back to the second half of our evidence con. I think there might be some people still missing because they are downstairs still drinking coffee, but I'm very optimistic that they will come up and um, you guys online, uh, you are still here, I can see that. And uh, now we will continue with the second half of our evidence con. As I said before, uh, now it, we will focus on not evidence for uh, digital, but digital for evidence. How can we use digital tools to generate higher quality, better evidence? And um, one of the, the really, like, one of the main uh, actors in this field is a company called Human First. And uh, we now have the honor to welcome Christine Manta from the US. Uh, she is a product manager of, at Human First and responsible for uh, developing and maintaining this uh, enormous infrastructure that uh, you built there for decentralized trials. And um, before that, I think you were at Dime as well, right, Christine? Mm -hmm. She's not in yep. there? OK, perfect. Um, and I think you were also involved in the playbook. So to everyone who is listening now, again, the recommendation, uh, go to the Dime website and uh, check out the Dime playbook for digital health. Um, I hope that uh, in the uh, medium or long run, uh, we will have like an international version of that playbook uh, with the DGDM and uh, Dime. But for now, um, Christine, uh, so you will tell us a little bit about your infrastructure and how you realize um, decentralized trials with uh, digital means. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And with that, the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you for that intro. Can you hear me OK? We can I'm hear assuming, you. Yes. OK. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so let's dive in. Um, I will skip um, a little bit on my background. Um, it was a great intro. Other group I'll highlight here is the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, City, which, which is where I was at prior to Human First. I'm working on some work with them that I'll highlight throughout this presentation as well. And that's a great group to also know and, and be familiar with their work. So we're going to talk about two different areas today. First, we'll cover why use digital tools in clinical trials, what are the benefits, and what are some of the perils to keep in mind to do this well. And then we'll do a deep dive on evidence quality, um, what does good look like um, when generating evidence for connected sensors um, within the context of a clinical trial. Um, so before we start aligning on a couple definitions, um, it seems like some of these resources were mentioned earlier, so this is great repetition. Um, so there is a book that was published uh, through some folks at DIME. You see Jen Goldsack here. Um, this book is available through Amazon and also through uh, Digital Biomarkers with Carter. It has, has some great 101 materials um, for those who are newer to the space and trying to learn some baseline. Um, also, the playbook, uh, which was mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the slides that I'll use today are, are from the playbook and highly recommend folks check this out um, as an awesome resource. Um, so there are multiple types of digital tools, and this is one of the definitions that I'd like to align on before diving in further. So the playbook and also what I'll talk about today in this presentation is focused on connected sensors that can be used in the home. So connected sensors um, you might hear the term digital measurement products as synonymous with that. You might hear the term wearables if, if the product can be worn. Um, and these are things that have a sensor and then some kind of software algorithm that runs on top of them. Um, what's not included in this category is things like digital therapeutics, um, things like video conferencing for telehealth, or survey-based assessments um, like patient-reported outcome surveys. So throughout the presentation, you'll hear me refer to connected sensor products or digital measurement products. And I will try very hard to not use the term device throughout. Um, device is considered a term of art from the FDA. Um, I'm based in the US. Um, so it has certain regulatory requirements in it. And not every connected sensor is considered a medical device. So I'll try very hard to not use that term. Um, so why remote monitoring? Why connected sensors in clinical trials? 
So remote monitoring can offer a more holistic view of a patient's lived experience with a condition. So historically, healthcare, you know, clinical care or clinical trial visits is very episodic. Um, you only get the data when the patient comes into the clinic. It's a snapshot of human health. We miss all of these other things. Um, so with connected sensors, remote monitoring at home, we get more insight into things like sleep, activity, gait, vital signs that can give us more insight into the, how the patient is experiencing their condition. Um, and it turns what used to be just snapshots into a movie. We just have more information by which to make more meaningful decisions on, which can be really powerful. So why specifically in clinical research or clinical trials? Um, so remote monitoring can accelerate timelines and decrease costs. And overall, I think one of the most powerful things here is being more patient-centric in our approaches. Um, so think about enrollment or re patient recruitment. One of the biggest barriers that comes up often is, well, I live in the suburbs. I don't want to commute into the city once a month to get my vital signs taken. Okay, let's shift that visit to home, reduce the patient burden to have to commute, um, and maybe they're more likely to enroll in the trial that way. Um, so we can increase study power, we can reduce sample sizes, and hopefully just have broader application in some of the work that we're doing through remote monitoring and connected sensors in the home. Um, so why now? Why is this gaining a lot of more traction, remote monitoring clinical trials? Um, a lot of the consumer-facing companies like Apple, Verily, Fitbit, Samsung, they're working with the FDA to get clearances, and wearables have pretty broad adoption in the public. Um, clinical trials themselves have a low success rate. One in five close with no results due to failure to recruit. Um, so if a decentralized approach with more at-home monitoring could facilitate increased recruitment, decreased patient burden, that'd be awesome. Um, healthcare costs are unacceptably high as well, so trying to be more patient-centric and shift that trend. And then ultimately, COVID has been an accelerant for a lot of this work and shifting from the hospital or in the site to home. I don't think that there's going to be any going back, um, so we need to adapt to this new environment um, where patients can feel safe in their homes and we don't have to pause a clinical trial um, due to a pandemic because we're able to shift those types of uh, data collection methods. Um, so pharma companies are definitely doing this. Um, the data that is um, presented on this slide is from the Digital Endpoints Library, which is on um, run through the Digital Medicine Society through DIME. Um, so 62 sponsors have collected some type of digital endpoint. You'll see some logos in here. Um, big names like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, GSK um, have done this. Um, they're implementing these endpoints across phases. Um, it's not just in phase four, it's throughout. Um, and there's a mix of primary, secondary, and exploratory endpoints as well. Um, so the time is now to start exploring a lot of these things um, and get that digital endpoint into your trial. Um, so we talked about some of the promises, some of the benefits of this. Um, there's also some perils if this isn't done well, and these things are covered in the playbook in that poor sensor selection can lead to non-adherence and missing data. And missing data is expensive because that might mean your, your trial fails. Uh, insufficiently validated sensors um, can lead to just mistrust from regulators or payers that this data is going to be meaningful. Um, and then unexpected firmware updates can lead to unusable data. So it has to do a lot with the software side. Um, so the area that I want to hone in on is the validated piece. Um, what does validated mean? Um, and how do you know if something has been sufficiently validated? What's that threshold bar? And what does good look like in a validation study? Right, let's get into it, evidence quality. So the term validation can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on what the person's background is. And so the Digital Medicine Society, again, uh, put together this V3 framework. It was published like over a year ago now um, and has definitely gained traction in the field. Um, so this breaks down what we mean by validation into three steps. So verification, that is evaluating the sample level sensor output. So I have a Fitbit here, um, which has an accelerometer in it, which is a sensor that measures uh, movement. So if I drop my Fitbit, verification is telling me that that accelerometer produced accurate data on the change in position. 
analytical validation is whether that sensor plus the algorithm produces an accurate measurement. Ideally, this is done in your desired population. Um, so if I'm wearing my Fitbit and I walk 100 steps, um, is that 100 steps accurate? And ideally, that accuracy is determined against a gold standard. So I walk 100 steps, um, a researcher is next to me counting my steps, do both the Fitbit and the step count equal 100? And then clinical validation is whether that measurement that, that is produced has any meaning or relevance to the condition that I have. Um, so let's say I have depression and anxiety. Um, does measuring steps per day have any relevance to how I feel throughout the day? Um, is it related to any meaningful change in my levels of depression? Um, so these are how the word validation breaks down into three different types of studies. Um, the V3 process is con can be conducted by different groups across different disciplines. Um, so verification is usually done by engineers at the bench tap. And then the analytical and clinical validation pieces can be done by both engineers and the clinically trained professionals. Um, so this is where these types of assessments could be done prior to implementing a connected sensor into a clinical trial um, for drug development or as part of that process. Um, so what are you looking for? Like what, what level of evidence is gonna be desired? What are the thresholds? What does good look like? Um, so the minimum threshold here is maybe you see a proposal or a white paper from the manufacturer that it has plans to run as part of the V3 process. That'd be a minimum. Um, the more desired threshold would be the white paper is produced. You can find it, you can read it. Um, and there's equivalent data uh, that shows that these V3 elements have been uh, thought through and completed, that, that process has been done. And ideally it's done within your context of use. So if you're running a clinical trial in Parkinson's, ideally there's some analytical validation that's been done in Parkinson's. You wanna look within that same uh, indication. High quality is well-documented V3 specifications, ideally published in multiple data sets. So as part of my work at Human First um, to build what we call our Atlas, um, which is a platform, um, a database that ingests data about connected sensors and also the evidence behind them to support that this V3 has been done. Um, and also the work I did at City. I've read like thousands upon thousands of, of papers um, that are evaluating connected sensors. I'm sure folks in the audience have as well. And we realized that it was really hard to know what well-documented meant. Um, what was the standard that we were looking for? And so I brought this, um, this issue to, to Jen at Dime and we realized, okay, there's probably something we could do about this um, to help the field know what does good look like when you're running a clinical validation or an analytical validation study. Um, so that's what I'm gonna get into there, to into next, the problem that we identified and then the solution um, that we that we built. Um, so through reading all of these papers, um, I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone that the quality of reporting in peer-reviewed literature evaluating digital measurement products is highly, highly variable. Um, there's inconsistencies in the metadata that's reported, and there's also variance in the evaluation protocols that are used. And ultimately, this leads to low confidence in researchers unnecessarily repeating work, which is expensive, time-consuming, and in some cases unethical if you're putting patients through the same type of evaluations when you could have had your answer after the first evaluation. Ultimately, that just adds to patient burden, and that's what we want to reduce. Um, so this was a systematic review that we did at City um, that was evaluating studies that use mobile technologies. Um, and so this is where we really saw the inconsistencies in metadata. Um, so 73% of the studies uh, didn't, only 73% of the studies reported the software. So there was like a 30% 30, 30 that did not. Um, nearly 10% did not report the make and model of the technology that was used. And there's a lot of variation in documenting what those sensor modalities are. And all, all of these things like prevents research from building on each other. Um, the technology changes so fast and research can happen so slow um, that by the time a research study gets published, 
that make and model that was used might already be outdated. Um, so it's really important to know what make and model and what software was used at the time that the study was done. Um, and so from looking at all of this uh, with, with DIME, with the DIME community, we decided that the speed um, to speed the development and deployment of these connected sensors that are worthy of our trust, we need to do something about improving the quality of evidence and getting everyone on the same page with what good looks like. So the solution that we came up with is called the evidence checklist. Um, evidence stands for evaluating connected sensor technologies. Um, pretty good acronym. Um, and so the evidence checklist, what it is, is a 25 item checklist that covers the universal requirements for best research practices, plus some unique considerations for sensor technologies and software. So it looks similar to uh, PRISM for systematic reviews or consort for clinical trials. And that got everyone on the same page. Journals bought into it for, hey, if you're gonna do a systematic review, this is what it's gotta look like in order to be published in our journal. And that's the same hope that we have for the evidence checklist is that it will promote high quality and consistent, consistent reporting um, in these studies where the primary objective is an evaluation of a connected sensor technology. Um, so things that we care about in the checklist, um, make and model, the selection rationale, why did you pick the technology that you picked? Was it out of convenience or was it because it truly was the one that was the most accurate in your patient population? Um, things about product availability, maturity, the sensor characteristics, um, things like the reference standard that was used. If you're gonna do an analytical validation study, there needs to be a reference standard um, to compare the performance of that sensor. And these are all things that help um, like I said before, build the body of evidence for a specific methodology instead of having to reduplicate work. Because um, for example, in terms of like wear location, there's an older Fitbit product um, that is a clip, so it's worn on your waist. Now all the most of the Fitbit products are wrist, are wrist worn. So if a, um, if a researcher who's running a validation study with the hip worn Fitbit and they just say Fitbit, and they don't document the wear location five, six years later when that study is ultimately published and being read by other researchers, they may just assume that that was risk worn. And that does has, have implications for the accuracy of the algorithm. Um, so noting all these things that seem kind of basic are really important um, to build some consistency. So the type of things that are in scope for evidence, and this is why I talked about V3 at the top. Um, as verification studies, analytical validation studies, and clinical validation studies. Um, you might also do a proof of concept, which is before you get into V3, just to give you a signal of whether this is gonna be feasible. And then also the utility and usability studies. So these evaluate the very practical considerations such as ease of use um, or comfort wearing the device or connected sensor. So for example, this Fitbit, um, it's my husband's and he actually stopped wearing it because it was so bulky when he would sleep that it like hurt his wrist. Um, so if he was in a clinical trial monitoring sleep, he would have had many days of missed data um, because he just stopped wearing it because it wasn't comfortable. Um, so these are all very practical considerations that we want to have documented um, to build trust that we're picking the right, the right tool for the job. Uh, just as important are things that are out of scope uh, for the evidence checklist. So things like surveys, things like meta adherence, um, and things like security, data privacy, and operational considerations, all super, super important things when picking a technology, um, but out of scope for this particular evidence checklist. Um, we did a decision tool of how to think about whether evidence applies to the work that you're doing. Um, so that is listed here and available through the DIME website. And then this has some resources. Uh, the DIME community loves feedback. Um, so if you use this checklist or have further questions about what we decided to include versus not, um, we'd love to hear from you and just links to the manuscript um, and how to download the checklist. And I will stop there. Hopefully made up some time um, and can get into the other speakers. Thank you um, for that uh, very nice talk. And it's very interesting to see, even though we are in this new realm of uh, evidence uh, through digital tools, the 
standards that we have from the old world of evidence, like the reporting standards and stuff like this, this is still important. Yeah? There are like some principles that are also important, even if we're talking about new forms of evidence. That was a very important message, I think, uh, of your talk. Thank you very much, Christine. And yes, you were well in time. Um, being in time, if we are in time, we will, at the end of this session, uh, have like a short Q&A round. So for those who are on the screen, you can use Slido to uh, ask questions to Christine or to Valerie or Andrea, who is uh, talking after Valerie. Um, and of course, you guys here, you will get like a microphone if you have any questions. For now, I want to introduce uh, Valerie Kirchberger, uh, who I got to know when she was still working at uh, Charité. She was uh, responsible for value-based healthcare. And I wonder how much value-based healthcare is being done at Charité since you left, because now she's working um, at Heartbeat Medical, a company that is working on patient-reported outcomes. And she will tell us about like a wide-scale model for analyzing patient-reported outcomes. Thank you very much. Valerie, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jan. Um, thanks for the lovely introduction, and yes, for sure, value-based healthcare is uh, to stay at the Charité. I will touch upon that quickly. So thanks uh, for the lovely introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I have to say, though it's rather late, I feel very energized from the great presentations that I heard from the speakers before me, and I want to actually give a virtual shout out to Andrea Pusik. I don't know whether she's already on there, but I have to say she has been such an inspiration for us. Um, we used her BreastQ questionnaires in our first pilot at the Charité, which we actually did together with Heartbeat Medical. That's the company where I am now. So I will speak about digital patient-reported outcomes with a focus on establishing wide-scale measurements of care delivery results. My name is Valerie Kirchberger. I'm Chief Medical Officer and Co-Managing Director at Heartbeat Medical Solutions. So what will I talk about? I will show you, hopefully, that PROMs are useful for generating evidence. That's the topic today. And I also think that it is time to implement them on a national level, or why not even on a European level, actually, having listened to the um, presentations today and yesterday. So why am I here? I want to give you a bit of a background of my story from medicine, from medical school to entrepreneurship. So many, many years ago, I went to medical school, and I loved everything about it like the, the work uh, under, with the microscope or open heart surgery that I got to get to witness. But I have to say, um, later on in my medical studies, I really got interested in public health management. And I do really love everything that Atu Gawande, you can see his book Complications up there, has um, published. So he's been such an inspiration for me. I did, though, pursue my medical internship in pediatrics. And I just have to say, the reality check in the hospital was quite tough on me. So I was very motivated, and I just found a situation with super engaged um, healthcare workers. Everyone who worked there wanted to do the best for their patients. But at this point when I started, some of the processes were digitized, some were not. So in many times, we actually had to document twice. There were silos within the hospitals, different specialties, everything was siloed and focused actually on us physicians and not so much, much on what the patient needs. And don't even get me started on the sort of fragmented uh, healthcare sector in Germany. So all of this kind of uh, was difficult for me to, to accept. And I got interested in the topic of value-based healthcare. I got to know Heartbeat, as I said, for our first pilot project at the Charité. And I convinced the board there to just let me start in the breast cancer center, implementing the iJob standard set for patient-reported outcome measurement. And it has proven a great success. And it, has, it is being rolled out at the Charité sort of as we speak. And in the um, Charité strategic paper, you can see a little blue thing at 217. Actually, the idea of value generation for the patient is also even written down. So I felt that was time and it was okay for me to leave and to pursue really with the focus, the topic of patient reported outcome measurement. And so here I am at Heartbeat Medical, focusing on building prompt solutions. And I will give you also one quick recap on the theory. The most important message is, Patient reported outcomes are not patient satisfaction. If you remember that, I'm fine. But I will re uh, read to you the, um, the definition of PROMS. They are self-reporting tools. They measure aspects of health status as well as outcomes of medical interventions from the patient's perspective and without the interpretation of a third person like a healthcare worker. 
To the right, you can see the domain of physical functioning that we use when we are asking our patients, are you able to do chores such as vacuuming or yard work to assess their physical functioning, one of the domains of health. So the patient's perspective on results, doesn't that sound like something that should be considered when talking about real-world evidence of care of new drugs or of interventions? Well, I do think um, it is uh, a crucial part. And let me tell you, PROM is happening, and that is one of the key messages from my side today. And I want to show you some bright spots in Switzerland and Germany on what is happening in terms of PROM and how they are used for or as real-world evidence. So in Switzerland, there's an organization called QNS. So what are they doing? They have actually um, started um, having PROMs as obligatory quality measurements for whole regions in, in Switzerland. Why is that great? It's because they're pushing the idea of using PROs for population health monitoring and basically using them as real-world evidence of the quality of care in their region. And I think that is a, a, a fantastic uh, endeavor that they um, have started there. They will have high quality and quantity of data through electronic PRO capture with us. And a very interesting part here is that the infrastructure costs are covered by the districts. So the burden for actually um, implementing a digital solution is not on the healthcare providers, which is still a big problem, obviously, at this point, because quality is not yet relevant for reimbursement in Germany, as you all know. Another example, speaking of Germany, a large provider network is committed to patient-reported outcome measurement for all their member hospitals. And that is also a, uh, an awesome project. The basis of this voluntary group, even before PROM, is a joint commitment of sharing data amongst peers to improve quality, so full transparency amongst each other. We are their partner for collecting PROs for, as I said, over 500 of their member hospitals. Standards will be used, and that's super important. We heard it all before. Only with standards, we will have comparability. Only with comparability of data, we can generate evidence and value for the patients. This is, to my knowledge, the first such network approach in Germany. And the last thing, I mean, we heard it before, but evidence from so-called clinical routine data is also increasingly accepted by regulatory bodies, which is a great um, development, we think. In some cases, pharma is required um, to deliver evidence to other data sources than the randomized controlled trials, which are those clinical routine data, klinische routine daten, as we call them um, in, in Germany or in German. And let me just say, we alone have implemented standardized outcome measurements within multiple hospitals, research projects, and institutions. We have over 250,000 patients that we have served with our technology. Why am I saying this? I th we have generated a wealth of clinical PRO data, and I think it is a, a waste and unethical even to not use all these clinically collected PRO data to generate evidence and to improve care which is the ultimate goal of the whole thing. Uh, PROs are crucial on our way uh, to a patient-centered care system, in our opinion. So now, I think now is the moment to plan on how to move ahead on a national level, actually. I think um, it, it is time to step away from the hospital-by-hospital -hospital approach. So what is required to measure and use PROs on a wide scale? I will tell you, like, give you four key requirements. You, you know all of them, and a lot of them are already pushed by the KZG and other um, laws. So standardization and comparability, that's really a no-brainer. High data quality is also, sounds like obvious, uh, an obvious requirement, but it is, it's not always the case. High quanti quantity, actually, also of data and usability, and obviously interoperability. So standardization and comparability. We need standards and content. So the questionnaires we ask should be standardized so, and in content and in tech because they enable comparability and only when we have transparency in the results of care and can work with continuous improvement measures, we will create value for the patients. Otherwise, we will just create dead data. Um, obviously, the culture in hospitals needs to change to make most of this new evidence. And I do believe that reporting on PROs should happen on a national level in a, something like a registry. We need high data quality. We need safe, reliable, and secure data collection at the patient's end and interpretation. No errors, no, no manipulation. So you need, uh, in the tech that you use, 
um, just uh, standards uh, in, in the way that the, that the data is handled, obviously. And I think we need digital collection to do this in a scalable way. Paper and pen has served for quite a while for the front runners of value-based healthcare and PROM. The Martini Clinic has done paper and pen for over a decade and done a perfect job. But to scale, digital is the better way. We need high quantity and with it usability of the data. The PROs should be available in high quantity so we can derive meaningful conclusions from it. I think that is also um, a pretty clear point. We believe, and also the data shows, um, that the PROs should be immediately available to caregivers and also to the patients in some way, shape, or form, like the EPA. Yeah? Because seeing your own data and feel, knowing that your doctor acts on it, it improves uh, the, the, the return rates from, in, from this, this measurement. And I think to make these data relevant for the stakeholders, the reimbursement system needs to include aspects of quality. I know this is very complicated on like, how to actually do this, but we need to move on to a system where we do not only in incentivize quantity, but some aspects actually of the quality of care. Well, and we do need interoperability. On the right, you can actually see that the loin codes that we're using to map to the promise items that, that we use in our questionnaires. So this is a moment, like a movement that is happening and we can just sort of tag along. The data need to be interoperable, of course, in order to bring together all these information, the real world evidence, ours or others, from different sources to generate evidence and to also display them in a meaningful way to the patient. And here, from our experience, we really need the EPA because the, show, the scores should be all available for the patients there. As I said, receiving the data as a patient really increases engagement. And I mean, all tech vendors have uh, to live up to those interoperability requirements anyway uh, um, required by the cards at GEA, so that's already happening. And I really believe in a system meeting these criteria and there are not too many, I believe, PROs will generate a, a wealth of usable evidence to improve care. So in summary, we all agree, I believe, that patient perspective has to be included in evidence generation. There are inspiring initiatives happening, and I could have told you about a lot more, but I wanted to stay in time. So and the requirements, I think, are also pretty clear. So now I do believe it's time, let's create a national strategy and enable wide-scale PRO implementation to create better healthcare. And with this, Jan, I'm also already ready to launch into the discussion if he is. Jan, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, I'm here. Today. Uh, perfect. And you are so yes. much in time. Mm -hmm. My goodness, I, I love to keep track of time. Yeah, uh, me too. Me too. <laughs> I love staying in time. Yeah, and we are in time. That's uh, just perfect. And my colleague Philip Kircher just showed me something funny. Um, okay, thank you for that. <laughs> no, but <laughs> do you need you, me? Thank you very to much. Go uh, or you can uh, you can sit up here if you're if you're fine with that. Sure. Um, yes, definitely. Let's talk. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, there was one a key word that you used. In your talk, uh, quality, and what I think, like uh, what we should have in mind, is like when we're talking about quality, and you all know the, these like Donabedian models of quality, right, with structure, uh, procedure, and, and outcome quality, mm -hmm. and patient-reported outcomes. I mean, it already says in the word is about outcomes, and we really have. I was working at the Federal Joint Committee for some time in quality assurance, and we really have a problem in measuring outcomes in uh, health, in healthcare. Like we are measuring a lot for like structures and procedures, and we are saying like if a clinic is like using so and so much disinfection spray, then there's probably like a better outcome than if they don't use any disinfection um, spray or whatever. And this is about like measuring the outcomes. You yes. want to say something about that? I just right wanted away. to say th those indicators are also very important. It's very important for us. To, we don't, we're not saying POMS will like fix everything. It's just a, v a very good additional uh, indicator on, on quality. 
Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to say like <laughs> abolish structure and uh, procedure. Exactly, uh, exactly. Don't do uh, that. Quality, don't do that. Uh, not at all. But this is like really like something where we can like directly focus on outcomes as well. So now, when you're uh, when we're talking about outcomes, when you're Googling something about um, outcomes, when you're Googling, uh, when you're searching on the internet, sorry, searching on the internet <laughs> for patient reported outcomes, uh, you will find a name sooner or later, and it would rather be sooner than later, um, that is apparently very connected with patient-reported outcomes. So that is the name of uh, Andrea Pusik. It's all good. good. Sorry. Um, so, Andrea Pusik, um, she is like uh, amazing. You should, we should have like a Wikipedia article. Andrea, I saw there is no Wikipedia article on you, which is a shame because you have to collect all the information about you like from different websites. I got all the information. You can find some on the website of the DMC. Uh, Andrea is really like uh, one of the big, big figures in uh, patient reported outcomes. Uh, she's in uh, plastic and uh, reconstructive surgery um, in the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in the US. And uh, you're really like um, one of the grand dams of uh, patient reported outcomes. So I'm very, very pleased to have you here, not live, uh, like live, but not on stage. But um, yeah, with that, Please uh, tell us something about, uh, Valerie already uh, said that they use the breast cue and you will talk about that now in detail. And with that, the stage is yours. Andrea, welcome. Thank you, thanks, Jan, and um, thank you, thank you for those kind words, and also uh, Valerie for your kind words about the breast cue. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today virtually, which is kind of the new reality, um, and um, to talk about innovations in uh, mobile health technology, and particularly with the focus on patient engagement and how we can increase patient engagement with in patient report outcome data collection. As Yann said, I'm, I'm a plastic surgeon. I'm uh, chief of plastic surgery at Brigham Women's Hospital. And, um, and that's, that is my clinical focus is, is breast surgery. Um, so just thinking a little bit about patient report outcomes in general. So clearly, PROs are very important in the world of surgery. That's my world. And that's um, important whether it's in terms of measuring symptoms, so a patient uh, recovering from an operation, measuring and, and monitoring symptoms, or quality of life outcomes. A lot of what we do in modern day surgery is with the goal of improving our patient's quality of life. And so to know if we've actually accomplished those goals, we need PROs. My comments today are, are really going to be a little bit more about the focus on clinical care and thinking about managing and monitoring symptoms and also understanding long-term quality of life outcomes. But I really appreciated Valerie's comments about the tremendous opportunity, the value and importance of large-scale patient report outcome data in the aggregate and the exciting opportunities we have to do to do things with that data. And I think Valerie did a great job of, of, of putting putting that that um, that challenge in front of us because, um, because there is so much in terms of thinking about it in terms of PROs for healthcare value, thinking about PROs and health quality. Um, but I think if we don't engage patients, which is in clinical care, then we, we can't get all that, that the, the data that we want to do so much with. So that's hence, I'm very excited about the idea of how do we increase patient engagement so we have high response rates, so we have high quality data. And I think to do that, we really need to engage with patients and give them something when we're asking them to respond to these PROs. And so where I think there's a lot of excitement right now is the opportunity to increase patient engagement engagement through patient-facing app, mobile apps and web applications that give patients immediate feedback and resources to help either manage their symptoms or understand the expected quality of life outcomes or improve upon those. So that's really my focus today. I'm going to talk, give you two examples. One from my previous hospital. I, um, I have been chief at Brigham Women's about three years, and so previously it was many years at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So going back a number of years then, we built a freestanding ambulatory surgery center for our ambulatory cancer patients. And as part of that, we set up a system where patients would have quite major operations like bilateral mastectomies or prostatectomies and they would go home within 23 hours. There are lots of advantages to that from a healthcare perspective um, and from cost perspective. There's However, a lot more, we ask a lot more of our patients. It does put a burden on patients if it's not well managed. I think we did a really great job of thinking about it, but it definitely going home 23 hours after a surgery with maybe with catheters, with drains, with pain medications on board, it's a lot. I'll just show one little example of when this kind of really, it was early on when we'd opened the center. 
And um, a pa it was a patient of mine, and she was a young pediatrician who'd had just had bilateral mastectomy surgery, or she was she was heading into bilateral mastectomy surgery. And through everything heading into surgery, she understood it. She was really well supported by her family, very intelligent, very reasonable woman. And then the morning after surgery, and surgery went very well. The morning after, I went to see her and found her crying before she was being discharged. And I said, you know, uh, Kathy, what's up? And, and she said, I just, I don't think I can go home. I, what will I, I don't, what, how will I know if something's going wrong? I don't know if I can manage this. And so that for me really struck me as I thought if someone who's in a, a well-supported young pediatrician is having a hard time going home, what about our other patients? So we took that back and thought, how can we support our patients better from not just while they're with us, but when they leave us. So the, essentially that sense of once you're out the door, we've still got you, we're still monitoring, we're still checking in on you. What we did is we set up a system of monitoring patient symptoms after surgery for 10 days, um, and it could go longer, um, where they were asked daily about their symptoms and just the regular symptoms that we would um, see after surgery. We actually got really high patient engagement around this. This is this idea of sort of getting of, of what matters because patients knew that we were watching them, that this was how we were keeping track. And if a, if a symptom was going off, it was going in the wrong direction, that they were going to get a phone call. And so what we saw is that 91% um, of our patients engaged with the system and, and gave us at least one data point. Um, and 70, 61% kept going beyond, um, beyond seven days. And some, some patients continued well beyond that. But what this generated is so patients would complete their um, the symptom assessment, and then this would generate um, an alert to the nurses if there was something that, was so say shortness of breath, or there was a um, more severe pain than might be expected, the nurses would, would call, or a patient would be instructed, hey, this is something you need to come and see us, you need to call us, you need to get an ambulance. Um, and, and quite remarkably, what happened with this is that what we saw was is because the patients were getting calls from the nurses, they were being told you know, how to manage these symptoms before they were getting to be, to be a more concerning level, what we saw Saw is, is that we saw a 22% decrease in patients going to our emergency department unnecessarily, meaning essentially someone who was worried well. And essentially they were, you might, you woke up in the morning with increased pain, but you didn't know if it was normal or not. So you went to the emergency department just by the fact that we were monitoring and being able to give them this feedback and someone was reaching out to them. It decreased our um, unnecessary unplanned care by 22%. And if we looked at the patients who were actually engaging with the system, we just at least gave us more you know, one or more data points, we saw a 42% reduction in returns to the emergency department. So that's all. That's a good part of the story. Then the 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 other side of the coin was it also generated a lot of nursing phone calls. So there was additional work for the nurses. So nursing phone calls went way up, as you can see in this graph. So that got us thinking, which was, what could we do to maybe give our patients a little more autonomy? So this was the, this idea of giving patients feedback directly as opposed to a phone call. Could we give patients information about how they're doing? Automate that and let them and help them better inter interpret this idea of sort of how am I doing? And if I'm not doing okay, what do I do about? it give them this information. And so that's what we did. And we generated these kinds of reports. So this would be a patient who is say four days after surgery. And the message this patient is getting is this is, um, you're experiencing actually less pain than is expected for four days after surgery. What they're seeing, if you look on the graph on the corner here, that blue line is data that we'd collected across all of our other patients that had, had the same procedure. So in this con in this, uh, this example was bilateral mastectomy surgery. So all of our other patients that had bilateral mastectomy surgery, that was their pain trajectory. So not only can this patient see how how she's doing she can also see what she can how she can expect to feel if all continues to go well over the next week to 10 days so as part of this work, we did a lot of qualitative work. We talked to patients and we asked them about their impressions of this. Before we did anything, before we had any kind of system, we heard things like, I worried about everything, looking for problems. This would be like my young pediatrician. I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know what normal is. I, I don't know when I should call you. Once we had remote monitoring and the nurses were making phone calls, patients told us, I felt more connected and cared for for a longer time period. And then once we added in the feedback, then what we saw was this kind of a comment. I felt more in control, like I didn't just have to wait and wonder if everything was okay. And so this kind of a feedback was the thing that was also driving our increased response rates to the system because patients knew that they were getting some feedback and, um, and data that could help them self-manage. So we, did, we subsequently went and we studied this. So we did a large randomized trial that was funded by PCORI, a Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And we essentially gave half of our patients got feedback 
half of them did um, had monitoring without feedback. Um, and these are some of the outcomes that we looked at. There was uh, we looked at unplanned un unplanned care, essentially patients coming into the emergency department, but um, not you know, essentially being reassured and leaving um, and adverse events. What we saw in this study was we did not see an increase in um, urgent care visits or a decrease. So basically, the gains that that forty two percent reduction that we'd seen in unnecessary returns to the emergency department that stayed stable. So it wasn't like by having patients self monitor and their feedback they didn't they didn't we didn't see that trend rise again. Similarly, we didn't see an increasing adverse events, which is good news because what we're saying we don't have the nurse we're not having as many nursing phone calls and, and resources, but but patients are still doing well. We're not seeing. Um, they're not mis self managing. Um, what we did see, though, was a diminution in nursing phone calls about uh, 0.4 fewer phone calls, which for this was actually both this was a significant diminution because, um, say, Sloan Kettering does about 10,000 uh, ambulatory surgery center, surgeries in the facility. And so that's about 4,000 phone calls, nursing phone calls um, in the course of a year. So, there, so a significant reduction. Um, also, perhaps even more importantly, was what we saw was a, a significant diminution in patient anxiety in the feedback limb, in the automated feedback and resources limb, which makes sense. You're recovering from surgery, and instead of waiting for the phone to ring to see if something's right or wrong, you would actually you would say, "Hey, looks like you're doing great," or be you know, "Here's here's some suggestions that might help you feel better," um, or "This is something you should give us a call about." So that made a lot of sense. Um, we also saw an increase in patient engagement. And, and to some extent, more qualitatively, we saw um, changes in family and caregiver burden. We didn't see this in the quantitative data, but qualitatively, caregivers told us they felt, more re they felt reassured to have resources at their fingertips. So if you're interested in reading more about this is the, the study that we, um, the, this is the key finding from this study. This is just published in Annals of Surgery um, quite, this was, uh, quite recently, last year. So that's one example. This was from, my, from Sloan Kettering. And then as I say, I'm now at Brigham Women's Hospital um, and very happy to be here. And we've and I'm director of our Proof Center. And so one of the big initiatives we set forward was to think about how we could increase patient engagement in patient point outcome measurement through the Proof Center, particularly in breast cancer care. And um, we did a lot of work again, talking to patients about what would what would engage, what would what would make them want to um, to complete long term patient report outcomes, and um, of which is Valerie said the um, the the breast keeping part of it, and also uh, the ICHOM outcome order set. Because again, thinking about how we think about healthcare value, the idea was really to how do we maintain a long term connection with our patients through again this idea of tailored assessments, feedback, and access to resources. So. Based on patient feedback and, um, and a lot of qualitative work, this is the system we built, and it's called the, the Improved Breast Cancer Care Program. And so this is currently an app. Um, patients, all of our patients are introduced to this. We just launched this about four months ago. Um, and, um, and basically, patients are invited to complete proms at, at, at a regular interval but they can also do it at in other intervals that they choose. They can essentially kind of order, they can answer questions whenever they want. It creates a graphic that they can see over time that gives them feedback about how they're doing, very similar to the MSK work about how they're doing and feedback about what they should do about that and links to all kinds of resources. So they, the app is loaded with videos, with all kinds of different things. I'm going to give you a little demo actually. So, but and everything that's based on is things that patients told us that they wanted to, um, to see. Um, and actually, you know what, I may not be able to do the demo, I apologize. I'm realizing that because I'm screen sharing, it may not work for us. Maybe Yan and the IT team, any thoughts on that? And, Andrea, did you, you're, you're sharing yourself, right? Uh, you, I'm, you yeah, I'm sharing my, yeah. I'm not seeing it. Oh, hang on, yeah, no, unfortunately, I think the play button, it's on, it works for me if I'm not screen sharing, I think, but, um, but somehow it's not clicking. So, well, my apologies for that. I'll, um, I'll just go back a Probably second next and time. talk a little bit yeah. more about mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but just to go back a little bit. So basically, when a when a patient logs in, they can um, you know, they're they're invited to complete proms about anything they want to talk about. So it can say, you know, what do you, you know, how are you feeling today? And they can choose from I want to talk about how I'm feeling emotionally, and then it will give them immediate feedback about how they're how they're doing, and then links to resources. So in the example that I would have shown you is a patient reporting worsening anxiety, and so that that provides them. You know, it looks like you're feeling a little more anxious today, and here's some links, and then it pushes them into that part of the app that shows the, the resources around that also gives them links to say other patient communities which are all sort of preloaded in the app um, so and again this was built based on what patients really told us that they wanted to see in this that would increase their engagement so our early experience is very positive um, 
the we've just again we just but it's it's an early experience. We have we've enrolled about fifteen hundred patients since we launched. So far, we're actually seeing really high. Qualitatively, we're seeing high patient satisfaction and engagement. Um, it's early days. We're at about a seventy four percent response rate in some of our clinics, aiming for eighty five and ninety percent. We're really saying this is how we look after you. This is our new way of doing things, very similar as we did at MSK. Um, this is a way I can keep track of a patient. I'm, I'm actually just in clinic today and, and talking to patients about Improve and saying, you know, this will allow me to you know, check in with you every six months, even when we're not seeing each other, um, to understand, say, you know, the, the, how your reconstructed breast may be doing relative to the radiation you've just received. So if any scar tissue is forming, we'll be able to sort of pick up on that. And you and I will both be able to see that graphic and um, and be able to follow follow things over time. So so I think the idea being just that we can really we're, I'm seeing increased patient engagement is also giving me an ability to really understand my patients better over time. Um, some of the challenges, it's not, you know, it's um, doing something new. There's always some challenges. I, we, we did initially when we launched, wondered about whether an app had been the right way to go with that. Um, part of the challenge is getting patients to actually um, to, to load an app on their phone. Um, people are a little, I think there's a little bit of app fatigue. We, over, we overcame that. We now have 95% of our patients are willing to do that. Um, but it does raise the question about whether a web application as opposed to an app makes more sense. Also, we're relying on patients in the long term in terms of notifications. They do get text messages that send them back to the app, and they also get notifications. But I do worry about that in the long term and being able to keep track of our patients. Our model is every patient, every visit, every time. So every time patients are coming to clinic, they're being asked to complete this. And um, that it, um, and I will just say also for Valerie, this does this does the back end of Improve has all of the we're collecting costs, we're collecting all the clinical variables. So this is also Improve is also designed as a as an engine for healthcare value and thinking about how we think about um, and 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 thinking about iCHOM and, and collecting all that information. Um, other challenges are ongoing maintenance and costs, and so just thinking about that within the app structure, whereas a web application might. Um, so we're, we're we're contemplating moving in that direction. Um, other exciting next steps and thinking about how this approach can be useful is that um, very interested what we're seeing is this an early experience is that patients that are um, in low resource settings this may actually be really useful to them we sort of the idea came out in COVID when we're thinking about it being harder to to um, bring our patients in and see our patients face to face but for some patients that's not that wasn't a new situation in COVID. For some patients, it's just always been difficult to, to get in to see their doctors, whether it's because you can't take time off work um, or you're just you're in, it's, you're in a low resource setting in terms of the healthcare setting that you're, um, that you're that you're receiving your breast cancer care. So, currently working with, some, with the Association of Community Cancer Centers across the U.S. and designing a study where we will part we're partnering with these um, these community cancer centers to understand how a, a system like Improve might be useful for patients um, that are more diverse that are um, of, um, that are they're, they're being cared for in more challenging situations. Um, and then based on the experience, also considering moving beyond breast cancer, because essentially we're testing the model in breast cancer. Um, and I think there's there's great opportunity to expand beyond that. So I guess my takeaway is, is that I think patient engagement is really important to PRO measurement. I think the comments about sort of large scale PRO data, I could not agree with more, but to get that data and to ensure that we're not just getting a biased sample, we really need to ensure that our response rates are high and to get high response rates, we have to, we have to engage with patients and give them what they want in terms of for that will further, um, that will make them excited to, to answer the next questionnaire that we send out, whether it's six months later or five years later. Um, in addition, I think that this, this approach has the, has the potential to improve patient experience, so patient satisfaction with our care, um, their actual outcomes. We're, we're studying this now and looking at how engagement around the, this increased engagement inks and links to resources could actually improve long-term quality of life. Um, and the quality of care that we're providing. As I showed you in the, in the MSK example, it can also, this can this, this approach can not only be, um, it doesn't have to require a lot, it can actually decrease resource utilization because to say we, we're making fewer nursing phone calls, we're actually connecting with our patients at more touch points. And so there's the opportunity to also be thinking again about cost um, and value. Um, so I will stop there. I'd be happy to take questions if that, yeah, and if that's possible. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, insightful talk uh, with these practical examples. Um, I think, yeah, that's um, really amazing what you did there and like more than 70% of the patients sticking to it and like uh, having a better 
better outcomes in the end. Also, it's like quite enormous already. Um, so we have quite we have some questions online, uh, but I would want to start with a question uh, of myself actually, um, and that is. When I hear of such cases as you just uh, showed, Andrea, and uh, also like when we hear from these Sloan Kettering cases or um, uh, in, in Germany also, we have some cases where you can show that you can improve outcomes uh, after hospitalization. Um, but then again, I can also see like quite practically that not every hospital in Germany is doing this, right? Not every hospital in Germany is like taking care of patient-reported outcomes. They are often not measuring them at all. Um, and I guess, uh, Andrea, you are probably <laughs> better to answer that, um, that it's also the case in the US that not every hospital there is like having a like, program for patient-reported outcome measurement. And why is that? What do we need? Is it, is it just about the money in the end? Like, do we just need like a different reimbursement structure? Or what, what other like, barriers are there for hospitals to implement patient-reported outcome measurements? Maybe, Andrea, yeah. you, you can start then. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to come. I'll start off that one. I think you raise a really important point. Currently, and just speaking of the U.S. perspective, the um, really PRO measurement is, is happening in um, academic places, big academic places that, have, that are well-funded. So an example would be the whole, uh, here it's called MGB, Mass General Brigham, massive prom data collection system. But what we're not seeing is, is in, in other places, in smaller centers, and hence my interest in working with the Association of Community Cancer Centers, that they're not. And, and part of it is because it's really, it takes a lot of energy and it takes money, it takes resources. Um, and so I think there's two parts to that. I think we need to find, we need to work on implementation strategies that are not as, as um, high touch, that don't require three research assistants sitting in clinic at everybody's elbow to help them ensure, you know, to collect proms. Um, we just need to make it doable. We can't just say it's everyone needs to spend more money. Um, equally, though, we have to acknowledge that PR data collection is critically important to, to modern day healthcare. It's no longer enough to say, you know, first do no harm. We didn't do anything wrong. What's really critical now, and I speak mainly to the main world of surgery, but it's it's also all of medicine, is it did where the where are the goals? When I say the surgery, where the, were those goals achieved as perceived by our patients? And that's really, I think, where healthcare quality is now. I, um, I agree, Andrea, and I just want to add, um, I've increasingly come to the conclusion that the next step actually is to start a sort of a basis, like a basic rollout really for all hospitals for the major conditions. Why am I saying this? We have the front runners right now, right? Like, like in Andrea's hospital, like the ones we are working with at Heartbeat. But in order to make this really a standard of care in Germany, I think we should provide a low th threshold solution, meaning it has to be integrated in the hospital information system that is crucial. And it has to be as little work as possible for the staff to do this. So in an ideal world, which is something that we actually offer, if the interface works, is that the patient gets asked once on admission, will you or do you want to participate in patient-reported outcome measurements? If they say yes, this gets documented in the clinical information system and according to the diagnosis they have, the adequate PRO set will automatically be started and then in three, six months and yearly be sent to them via email, actually, in, in our case. And um, I think this is the first step that we have to take because those prime like examples like at um, Brigham and Women's with those dedicated apps, they are great. But as she said, in, in more resource poor settings, this I think is not the way. So just that's a basic that has as little administrative burden as possible, I think is, is the way. And it's the same that we discussed with the DIGAS, right? What is the acceptance for physicians? It cannot be initially be more work for them because that, that just won't work for the major of, of healthcare providers. Those are my two cents on this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we hope that we will find a way to, to stimulate that a little bit. Um, now I have a, a question um, uh, that someone posted online, and I think that is first going to Christine, and that is about like using sensors. When we're using sensors to collect uh, patient-reported outcomes, um, 
how do we make sure and I mean, this question here is specifically for the European context, but I think it's something that um, it should be um, available for the US context as well, is how do we make sure that uh, it's privacy compliant? Like, how do we make sure when we're using, like, I'm, I'm for example, wearing this Apple Watch, yeah, and I mean, Apple is, like, advertising their privacy things all, uh, everywhere, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure <laughs> whether my data is really, like, 100% safe uh, with the... Uh, uh, with Apple. And I mean, we are talking about healthcare data. And we are talking, uh, Christine, you had this nice chart um, with the data, like the longitudinal data. We don't want to see only data like every now and then when mm. someone is at the doctor's or in a hospital, but we want to see like data from every daytime, nighttime. Um, and I mean, so it's very sensitive data. And how do we, how do we make sure that like People are trusting it. I, I don't know how it is in the US, actually, but in Germany, at least, I can say, and I think in Europe uh, in general, uh, people are quite hesitant when it's about like wearing such gadgets, uh, and they don't quite know what kind of data is uh, transferred. And like, how do you collaborate with a, with a big producers? Like Fitbit was bought by, who was it? Who bought Fitbit? Google. Google. Fitbit yeah. was bought by Google, yep. Uh, for 2.3 billion or something like this, right? That was a bad deal. Yeah. Mine cost <laughs> like like 60, 60 euros. Yeah, I bought my. No, but I mean, like, are you collaborating with these um, producers, or, or who is who's like in charge for privacy when you're using sensors? Yeah, it's a really awesome question and definitely comes up pretty often um, when we're talking to groups, especially the pharma companies we work with. They always want to know if it's GDPR compliant. Um, a lot of the clinicians that we work with want to know if the data is covered under HIPAA, um, which is something that's, I think, more unique to the U.S. So one of the challenges we face is that there's not just one um, government organization that's responsible for monitoring this stuff in the U.S. It spans a couple different groups. And I don't really feel like there's a tone of like, my dad is out there. I can't do anything about it. And it's like this feeling of powerlessness of either like, I, I can't do anything about it, so might as well just whatever. Or like, I'm never doing anything because I don't want my stuff out there. Like people are on very two ends of the spectrum. Um, so at Human First, um, we have on our team a woman who used to work at Consumer Reports, which is an organization in the U.S. that does evaluations of products, not just healthcare, but like if you want to buy a refrigerator, you would go to Consumer Reports and get their like rating on it. Um, and she works in privacy and she's taught me so much about it. Um, her name's Dina Mendelson. She did some of the sections in the playbook that are, that cover this area on ethics and privacy. So I'd encourage folks to check out her sections in there. Um, and she has really taught me a lot of things. So like HIPAA doesn't apply to a lot of the wearable data that's out there, which definitely creates some concerns. Um, and it does come from like, she has manually read every single privacy policy for the thousand plus connected sensors that we have in Atlas. And it is scary. Some of the discrepancies that people don't report the last time that the privacy policy was updated, whether they share their data with, with third party groups. Um, so that's something that we do track at human first and that we care a lot about. Um, so my recommendations um, for folks who are thinking about this question is definitely check out the playbook, look at the ethics and privacy section, um, and then check out the privacy policy for the tool that you're thinking of and definitely look for those keywords around last updated and third party apps. So yeah, it's, it's tough. We need to be advocates for, for ourselves here. Mm -hmm. uh, Valerie, are you using uh, sensors? In no. You mean like me, Valerie, or we at Heartbeat? No, no, heartbeat. Yeah, uh, heartbeat. <laughs> I was like, at first, I mean, no, um, not yet, but we have a lot of sort of like partners looking looking to, to do this with us. We don't do it at the moment, but sure, if the need is there, and if we can, I mean, it's important to, if we put through this wearable data to the physicians, they also should want it. And that's, I think, a thing with the wearables, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to dump your EKG data, data for example, on your breast cancer surgeon, most likely, because that is really not what she cares about at the moment. So it needs to make sense which data from which wearable device is put through to whom. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience here? Uh, in the back there. One question there in the background. So, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much for this. all the talks. It was very impressive. I just have a question. Uh, you mentioned it should take not too much work to 
record these patient reported outcomes. And I w I'm wondering why should it take any more work at all? I mean, when I talk to my patients, I usually ask them questions and they report to me the answers. Usually I don't call them outcomes, but rather anamnesia or patient history information. So I was just wondering, uh, when we talk about outcomes, we usually use them for quality control. You, you look like you couldn't hear me. It's, it's, I have difficulties with the, with the acoustics, but just continue. But I, I will think Andrea and Christina. Uh, oh, so, okay. no, please continue. We will so I'll try to make it short. The no. question is, um, we use patient history information in the communication between doctor and patient. Why isn't that the same like patient reported outcomes? So do we do, do we as doctors do it the wrong way? Or are the patient reported outcomes actually not for care, but just for quality control purposes? Why don't we just simply compare this? Mm. So, sorry, Jan, can you summarize for me? So, it's the I acoustics, mean, I think the question. If I understood it right, I mean, uh, the, the question is like, why should it make any, any more work for the, for the patients, right? I mean, like. What's the no. question? Why do we need PROs at all? Because we have the medical history data. Sorry, it's really the acoustics. I'm sure it's not you. No, I try to come closer, maybe then it's easier. No, I'm saying when you record the medical history of a patient yes. in your communication simply, you report the same type of information as which, which could be considered a patient reported outcome, right? So why do we not enter this into our clinical hospital ah, information system okay. in a way that it is standardized, stratified. So you said the patient, the, the doctors don't accept this. So why is that? I, I okay. don't really understand that. I, I think I've got it now. So what you're saying is why do, we, do you need an extra a, a actual digital tool to collect those PROs and why not do this straight from the clinical information system? Kind of. I mean, and also the communication. I mean, first let me say it's not exactly the same, right? So the medical history deals a lot sort of with the past and then of course with the current state of health. And here I agree, that would be sort of the, the baseline um, in, in my world. I would say that not every medical history at this point taken in Germany concludes or includes such a thorough sort of assessment like we do in the, in the baseline, right? So we ask about the level. I mean, I see you making a doubtful face. Sure, where you work, that, that's the case. I actually do agree um, that what we do, well, how can I phrase this? Um, it's, it's an addition, yeah? So it starts from the medical history. We take a, a thorough assessment of the, those levels, those um, domains of health at sort of baseline zero. And then, but then some, we collect something that is actually, actually additional and new because we collect those outcomes later on. And that is not something that you usually do in the delivery of care, right? Outside of, I mean, outside of, of any clinical studies, there is no in Germany, to my knowledge, but you can correct me, um, continued monitoring of the results of care by asking patients if. Uh, okay, Jochen, Jochen is like yeah, maybe we not 100% uh, um, sure about that, but I think we can discuss that later maybe. Definitely. Um, Andrea and uh, Christine, uh, I think we should um, come to an end now because we want to wrap up this whole uh, event. I'm uh, super, super glad uh, that you joined us here today. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to the US. We wish you a great day. You are heartily invited, of course, to stay until the end of this event, which will be in nine minutes. Sharp. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, I hope to uh, see you in person. And Andrea, I want to see like the live show of the app. Yeah, um, that didn't work out today, but uh, next time I'm sure that uh, you will be able sure. to show that to us. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you also, Valerie. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So that was our uh, evidence con, and I think like we are really now the the final the final resort here, the last resort, I think the other workshops are uh, already finished. So I think there was a very interesting, um, interesting conference now that, from my perspective, raised more questions than it answered, but that's also because we had like four hours now, and of course there are a lot of, a lot of uh, questions out there that cannot be answered in a four-hour um, evidence con, but there will be more. 
Uh, there will be more in individual uh, companies that are dealing with the topic. There will be more at uh, hospitals and at uh, universities that are developing it. And of course, as I said at the beginning, Filippo, please join me on stage. And uh, I hope that Jen is still in the call so that we can, yeah. Hi, Jen. Uh, hi, Beck. Uh, so, I mean, the, the topic is very important, and as we have seen, there are still a lot of questions that are raised. And I think it's not actually not only a topic of digital tools. It's a topic that we have to face in general in the healthcare system. We don't want to pay a pub, uh, for, in a, in a publicly funded healthcare system, we don't want to pay for things that don't work, that don't bring any benefit. Um, that we, don't, we don't have that money, right? We have scarce resources here. Um, so we have to take care of the evidence. And we can see that uh, Valerie showed at John Federal Committee already that they are now, like there is now this rule in the law as well that allows for real world evidence in a cert to a certain extent. And I think we have to uh, really work on this topic now at the example of digital health, uh, which might be at the forefront uh, to develop new tools and using new tools for evidence generation. Uh, and in the long run, the whole system might um, really benefit from that. So, but for now, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, the high hub, the Health Innovation Hub will be dissolved at the end of this year. And after that, it will be in your hands. I'm like, I should do like this. Okay, Jen and Filippo, I already said that at the beginning, uh, the, the Digital Medicine Conference, I hope is like in good hands and uh, I want to, want to ask you, like, what's your feeling? What's your next plans now? Now, I mean, you're responsible now, right? I mean, like, I will ring both of you in five years from now and say, <laughs> tell you, like, how I think the evidence landscape is uh, when it comes to digital um, uh, health. So uh, please do something with it. How do, you, how do you feel? What's your next steps? So maybe, Jen, you, do you want to start, ladies, first? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, Yang, congratulations um, on such a wonderful day. And thank you to all of the fantastic presenters, panelists, and folks in the audience who have had such great questions through the course of the day. You know, I think that we have learned a couple of things from today's conversations um, that actually dovetail really nicely with the best practice and what we've learned from HIH, right? We've learned how necessary it is to take a collaborative approach to all of this work. We've been reminded of the importance of high quality evidence and perhaps now going beyond just the presence of evidence, but as the field starts to mature and as we strive to take the promise of digital to scale, we need to start to think about standardized approaches to building out that body of evidence and to understanding what evidence is required by different decision makers within the field. Um, I think part of that standardization pro, um, process not all of it, but part of it is around really thoughtful legislation and regulation that governs our field. And again, I think this is a place where sort of HIH um, and our German sort of policy colleagues have really led the way globally. And I think the, th the, the final point, and um, Jan, uh, this starts to answer your question about sort of what, what is our community at Dime going to do? Um, we need to be intentional. There's a lot of decisions that are on deck. And Jan, you said you'll call us back in five years. I'll say, you know, if your goal is to check in on us, I think five years will be too long. I think we have a very narrow window as a field. Technology innovation is moving very quickly. The needs of the patient population and society are very high. And the expectations of the patients and the people that we're all here to serve who enjoy digital and expect digital in every era of their every other area of their life, their expectations are high. So what we really need to think about doing is being intentional in our decision making, collaborating, insisting on evidence, solving the most pressing problems to make sure that as we digitize healthcare, we fulfill the fill the full promise of improving quality of care, reducing costs, improving access, improving efficiency, um, improving health equity, and make sure that we um, under no circumstances introduce new harms, um, harms around sort of that may be introduced by privacy or maybe um, not getting it right with equity and sort of increasing health disparities. There's enormous possibility and it's up to us to be intentional. And we look forward to continuing the charge that the HIH sort of started so wonderfully um, and driving towards um, a future where sort of we've deployed these tools in a way that's safe, effective, ethical and equitable. And with that, Jan, let me hand back to you. 
Thank you very much, Jen. So, Philip, thank you. So, uh, I, I have to admit it was a really, really, really interesting conference here. We saw a lot of different things here, a total virtual study. We talked about problems. And I love to see that so many people are getting involved in this topic because if we think of this kind of event three or four years back, nobody, no, nobody, but not a lot of people would have been here and also being virtually uh, with us now. So, I love to see that all the people get involved. And my vision is, and I think these kind of conferences are the basis to it that we get in touch that we build corporations to to have a better a better future healthcare being more democratic being more european being more fair more low threshold in my opinion digital medicine is the way to it so i'm very happy to be part of it and also very happy to yeah to be one of the associations now being also in charge uh, with dime together to to host equal events, hopefully that good as this event has been. So I'm very proud that I've been here and I, from our perspective, the only thing we can do is to thank you for this good work you've done with the HIH. So thanks a lot. We want to keep up to the standard <laughs> in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, especially like Julia and Ariel. I hope that they are still here, um, uh, like on, uh, on the screens. Um, thank you for uh, everything here. So now we are coming to an end of the evidence con, but it's not the end of the DMC because I now want to ask our one and only chairman to take over and say some words about the whole thing, the DMC and everything. Well, thanks very much, Jan, and uh, thank you for um, uh, everyone who participated. Uh, on this um, uh, four-hour uh, marathon um, evidence con, which indeed was uh, was was really um, um, uh, stunning, um, how much uh, how much progress really has been made.